Hey everyone, continuing on with my Hellboy coverage now. In this video, I am going to be breaking down the Wild Hunt story arc. The last story arc was called The Darkness Calls, and at the end of that one, Hellboy he escaped Baba Yaga's dimension. And meanwhile, going on at the same time, Grugach was collecting this Queen of Blood. So now in this Wild Hunt story arc, we're going to see uh, Hellboy's further adventures, and then we're going to see Grugach continuing to try to reawaken the Queen of Blood. And eventually we're going to see how they are going to uh, wind up on a collision path. All right, let's dive into it. Hellboy the Wild Hunt. Hellboy the Wild Hunt, written by Mike Mignola, art by Duncan Fergrito. Hellboy the Wild Hunt, chapter one of eight. Hellboy, he has a dream. In that dream, he is in a clearing, watching the funeral of King Dagda, the king of the fairy, who died in the last story arc. Hellboy sees the many people in attendance. He is told by a talking bird that soon all of fairy kind will leave the world forever. Also at that funeral, Hellboy gets a glimpse of a woman with red hair. Her name is... Alice Monahan. Alice Monahan was the baby that Hellboy saved in the corpse short story, which was set in the year 1959. In that storyline, fairies kidnapped Alice to raise her as their own, because they could no longer have children. Hellboy, he rescued her by going on an errand and taking a corpse to the appropriate grave. Alice would be in her early 50s now although she looks remarkably young, a trait attributed to her spending so much time with the fairies. Hellboy, he sees a glimpse of Alice at this funeral, and then he wakes up from his dream. When Hellboy wakes up, he is still in Italy. He is staying with some friends of his named the Capobianco sisters. The two sisters give Hellboy some mail. At first, the two sisters look normal and human, but then we see they are dead and skeletons. They are dead, just like Harry Middleton was dead in the Darkness Calls story arc. Hellboy he inspects this letter, and he sees it is from the Osiris Club. The first time we met the Osiris Club was in the short story titled The Nature of the Beast, which was set in the year 1954. In that story arc, the Osiris Club saw Hellboy as a possible candidate to be their prophesied king, and they tasked him in slaying a dragon that was slain by a Saint Leonard. This would be a test of Hellboy's virtue. However, the test results remained unclear. Hellboy, he managed to slay this Saint Leonard worm, but he did so in an inconclusive way. So the Osiris Club was never certain that Hellboy was actually their prophesied king. But during his battle with this creature, Hellboy had some wounds and some of his blood fell to the ground and lilies grew from it, echoing the ancient legend of this Saint Leonard. That was over 50 years ago though, when Hellboy has not had any interactions with them since then. Hellboy, he decides to go to England to meet with this Osiris Club. In a ruined building there, Hellboy meets three men from the club. The Osiris Club members there talk about how it's been hard keeping track of Hellboy and all of his various adventures. They then tell Hellboy of a problem they have. Six giants have risen from their graves, and they are walking about, causing trouble. So the Osiris Club is putting together something called a wild hunt to take them down. Hellboy and these Osiris Club members are walking through the building there. Hellboy's looking at some old photographs. In one of them, he sees a previous Wild Hunt, and he sees some of the Wild Hunt members wearing masks. Hellboy asks, What's the deal with the masks? One of the Osiris Club members answers, Tradition. All regular officers of the hunt shall go in masks and keep their identity secret till they've drawn blood. Hellboy points to another man and says, how about the guy with the deer head? And then one of the men in the room wearing that deer head says, That's the Huntmaster. 
It is his honor to represent Hearn, God of the Hunt. Hellboy seeing the guy in the deer mask comments, Must get hot in there. The Huntmaster replies, As Huntmaster, I choose the hunters from the old and noble families of England, and on rare occasions I choose an outsider to join the hunt. Hellboy, what do you say? Will you ride out with us to kill giants? Hellboy, he quickly contemplates it and says, Sure, why not? Elsewhere in England, Grugach is still dragging the box of the Queen of Blood. She still has not risen from that box. Grugach has brought the box to the top of a hill amidst various fey creatures. Some of the creatures there ask Grugach, when's the queen gonna come out and talk to them? Grugach snips back. She'll speak when she's ready to speak. Till then, I speak for her. The creature replies to Grugach, Gah! This army, these poor creatures of England, their king is dead. King Dagda is dead. And you promised them a queen. She'd better be coming. For it'll be hell to pay Grugach and your head to roll for it. So Grugach has this queen of blood. And he wants her to arise so that they can assemble an army. Back over to Hellboy and the Osiris Club on their so-called Wild Hunt. The Wild Hunt all ride out together on horseback and they approach a bridge. But then, surprisingly, one of the Wild Hunt members turns on Hellboy and impales him with a spear. Hellboy with a spear in his chest tumbles into the river. The Wild Hunt member that stabbed Hellboy says, Die, monster! You should never have come back, cousin. We know what you are, and the devil will never sit on the throne of England. Hellboy confused says, What the hell are you talking about? That Wild Hunt member then activates the spear that is still in Hellboy's body, and it electrifies Hellboy. The Wild Hunt Chapter 2 of 8 Hellboy he is still impaled, lying at the bottom of the river bank, also being electrocuted. While that is happening, Hellboy has a vision. He finds himself in a room full of dead knights, and at the center of that room sits a figure with a crown on his head, and a rad dragon on the chest of his armor. Hellboy all of a sudden wakes up from that vision, and he is still in that river, but all of the hunters are now dead. They were killed by those giants that they were here to hunt. A talking bird speaks with Hellboy. The bird warns Hellboy that the giants are still near. Hellboy asks the bird, How do the giants miss me? The bird explains, You're invisible. Look in your hand. In Hellboy's hand, he sees a small flower there. The bird continues explaining, It's a gift from my mistress. So long as you hold that flower, you're invisible. Now follow me. Hellboy, he doesn't want to follow the bird, though. He wants to go towards those giants. The bird warns Hellboy, no, not that way. Hellboy says, hey, you said I'm invisible, so let's see. Hellboy, he walks right by those giants, and they do not see him. Although Hellboy got so close to them that they do start smelling him. Hellboy, he could have just walked away from this fight and not killed the giants, but Hellboy, he's up for some fighting. He says aloud, ah, screw it. Hellboy, he drops the flower that would keep him invisible to the ground, and then he starts fighting the giants. He's shooting some of them, evading some of their fist slams to the ground, and Hellboy, he is making quick work of them. He taunts them saying, oh yeah, you guys like that? Come on. Elsewhere, Grugach is approached by Astroth. Astroth explains that he is there looking for Grugach. Grugach answers, you found him. Astroth responds, I don't think so. I saw him once years ago when the elves rode out against the giants under the banner of a king now dead. He rode beside the sons of that king. Grugach looking depressed says, that was a good day. In those days, I had all my powers. I could change my shape to anything at all, and that day I became a monster and killed 20 giants myself. Astaroth to this says, Yeah, that's the story I heard. 
What happened to you? Krugach answers, love. Krugach explains that he fell in love with a human girl, and the girl she wished to see the form that Krugach took when he fought those giants. Krugach was reluctant to do so, fearing that she would be frightened by him. And there was also a strange law which meant that should the girl scream at the sight of his monstrous form, Grugach would be banished to some sort of purgatorial land of mists and never be seen again. Astroth asks, why would that happen? Grugach answers, I don't remember, it was a long time ago, but I knew that it would. So Grugach, he turned into his monster form, and the girl was a little frightened by him, but she did not scream. Grugach could see the fear in her though, so he transformed into a small little songbird so that she would no longer be afraid. However, when he did that, a cat appeared, and it was going to pounce at him, and the girl screamed to warn Grugach. So even though her scream was for a different reason, Grugach was still lost to the mists and spirited away. Grugach in that land of mists wandered alone in the dark for a long, long time till he almost nearly forgot himself, and then he stumbled back into the world. Grugach then relays the story of the corpse storyline, where he ran into Hellboy. Near the end of that storyline, Grugach released a creature named Grom to attack Hellboy, but Grom ate Grugach, and then Hellboy fought Grom and somehow beat him with some magic and caused Grom to shrink to the small size he is now. Grugach was still inside the body of Grom, and eventually over time, his spirit drove out Grom's spirit, and he took over that body. So that is why Grugach is in the form he is now. Grugach tells Astra, till she sets me free, till she makes me what I was again. Grugach believes the Queen of Blood may be his redemption. She may be able to return him to his former glory. Astaroth asks, you, you believe that she will? Grugach, he answers, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I thought I heard her speak once, but now I don't hear anything. Astaroth asks, Grugach, but you have faith, don't you? Grugach answers, I do. Astaroth to this says, good. Astaroth then gives Grugach a gold cup filled with the blood of an entire village nearby that is now dead. Grugach then takes that gold cup of blood and he pours the blood into the box. And then finally, the Queen of Blood, now reborn, rises from the box covered in blood and she addresses the crowd saying, Behold your Queen! The Wild Hunt, Chapter 3 of 8. Hellboy, he travels to Alice Monaghan's house in Ireland. Hellboy had periodically checked in on Alice as she was growing up, but it has been about 43 years since he was here last. Hellboy tells Alice that he meant to come visit her again soon after seeing her at Dagda's funeral, but then he ran into some trouble. Hellboy is referring to the giant fight he had recently. Alice responds, well, better late than never. She then tells Hellboy that the two of them have to go and meet someone. Elsewhere, the Queen of Blood is sitting on the box that once held her body. Some witches approach the Queen of Blood and talk with her. The Queen of Blood asks, where are the witches of England? One of the witches responds, Half are dead, drowned. They threw themselves into the sea when they heard you had come back. And most of the rest are in hiding until they hear how you are disposed toward them. The Queen of Blood recognizes this witch as one who betrayed her hundreds of years ago. She tells the witch, Come closer, closer, hold out your hand. Ah, here was the cup of poison and the knife that cut my throat. The Queen of Blood touches the witch's hand, and the witch's hand goes black and dies. The Queen of Blood will let this witch live though, she tells her, You were brave to come here. The witch asks for another witch from her past, Ganita. Ganita bows down before the Queen of Blood. She says, 
I prayed this day would come all these years, that somehow you'd come back to us, that you'd take your rightful place as our queen. The Queen of Blood tells her to rise, and she says, I trusted you most of all, but it was you who put the poison and knives in the other witches' hearts. You turned them all against me. The Queen of Blood, with some magic, twists the spine of that witch that betrayed her all those years ago, and she twists her into a very uncomfortable position. The witch begs for death, but the Queen of Blood does not oblige. This will be the extent of the Queen of Blood's revenge. She tells the other witches there, Now I'm settled with all the witches, and I forgive them for leaving me in this box so long. They should come to me now, and the rest will follow. The Queen of Blood then speaks to Grugach, and she calls for an army of the forgotten people to rise with her. Back over to Hellboy and Alice. They are traveling to meet with a woman named Queen Mab. While they are walking towards her, Hellboy asks what this is all about. Alice explains that she has been told there's going to be a war, and that it is Hellboy's fault because he wronged Grugach, destroyed Hecate, and refused to become King of the Witches. So Grugach in return has raised a new queen, the Queen of Blood. And the Queen of Blood is a hundred times more horrible though than their first queen. Someone who's going to stir up the worst of the old creatures and band them together. Queen Mab then finally reveals herself. She tells Hellboy, Everything the girl told you is true. This new queen, once a witch herself, but now something else. She wants a war, but it's a war with no victory. She only cares for the spilling of blood. All blood. It isn't fair to blame you for this. I know your heart, but I also know your blood. I know what happened to you in the sea, and I know what happened to you on that island. You died there. So Queen Mab, she's talking about the island story arc, and she is explaining some stuff to us that we may not have fully realized at the time when going through that story. She says, You died there and a dead man took your blood to restore himself to life, to fashion himself a new body from it. And what did he become? The thing you were meant to be. The truth is that you were sent to destroy the world. I know you destroyed that creature, but all those months in that little boat, wasn't he with you there every day? Just as he has been with you every day since. You drink, you hide with ghosts in their houses, but you cannot escape him any more than you can escape your own shadow. This thing is part of you, maybe the biggest part, and continue as you have been and it will consume you. The truth is that it's already begun, hasn't it? Queen Mab is essentially reiterating what we have heard many times already, that Hellboy is destined to destroy the world, even if he tries to reject that destiny. Mab does tell Hellboy, though, one chance for you to escape your fate. You are your father's son, but you also had a mother. Either way, you are bound to wear a crown. A king is wanted to call and command an army to oppose this queen of blood. Hellboy questions, you want an army? I know some guys, I can make a phone call. Queen Mab responds, no army of men. By the time men see what's coming, it will be too late. Hellboy is confused. Queen Mab, she just says, you will have to hurry. You are running out of time. Queen Mab then disappears. Alice and Hellboy are puzzled. Alice says to Hellboy, Well, that was a thing. What was that she said about you dying, Hellboy? Before Hellboy can answer, all of a sudden a strange, mysterious creature appears beside Alice and says hello to her. This creature is known as Edmund, Duke of Gloucester. Hellboy the Wild Hunt, Chapter 4 of 8 Hellboy, he remembers back to when he was slaughtering those giants a few issues ago. And when he was fighting them, his horns grew back. When Hellboy is in situations of intense emotion or danger, like during the battle with those giants, the power of his heritage begins to manifest more strongly. 
thereby the regrowth of his horns in that moment, represents Hellboy losing some control over his demonic side, and the horns are a sign of his potential to become Anugen Rama, the destroyer of the world once again. No matter how much Hellboy tries to avoid it, his destiny is always lurking beneath the surface. Back to the current day now once again. Hellboy and Alice Monaghan are talking to this Edmund, the Duke of Gloucester. Edmund introduces himself and Alice and Hellboy doubt that this creature is actually a duke. Edmund tells them that he is here because old Mab left him to help Hellboy find this army he's going to need. Hellboy and Alice decide to trust this Edmund and they let Edmund lead them. So Edmund is leading them while Alice and Hellboy follow behind. As they are walking, Edmund eventually asks if Hellboy remembers a goddess that once lived under a tree in Lysishire. Edmund explains, you know, people used to hang gifts for her in that tree. Hellboy answers, I know that tree. It's in front of a cave. A cannibal hag used to live in that cave. And every once in a while, she'd grab little kids and eat them and hang their skins in that tree. Edmund questions, does she still live? Hellboy answers, no. Hellboy, he killed that creature back in 1962. Edmund replies, poor thing. She was beautiful in her time. Ah, but cursed with long life and abandoned by her people. What do you think became of them? As Edmund says that, a whole bunch of small men rise from the ground and attack Hellboy. It appears that Edmund has led Hellboy into a trap. Edmund tells Hellboy, you murdering bastard, how much golden blood is on your hands now? Hellboy, he starts fighting through these small little men that have risen from the ground. The little men throw small poison spears, and one of them happens to hit Alice in her hand. As all this fighting is going on, three white birds fly down. They start flying around Edmund and pecking at him, and Edmund, he loses his footing and he falls to the ground. The small men then run away in fear. The three birds, they then transform into women, and they speak with Hellboy. They tell him that Alice is poisoned and she will die. Hellboy asks the birds, can you help her? The birds answer, our lady has medicine. Hellboy says, all right then, let's go. How far is it? And listen, you guys better not be jerking me around. The birds tell Hellboy to close his eyes. Hellboy, he does so. And then they tell him, open them. Hellboy, he does. And in that short blink of his eyes, Hellboy and Alice have been transported and they are now outside of a castle surrounded by a moat of fire. Hellboy the Wild Hunt, Chapter 5 of 8 Over in England, Grugach is sitting with the Queen of Blood. He is lying on her lap. They are both watching slowly as the Queen of Blood's army is beginning to assemble. Grugach, who wishes to be restored to his former glory, starts hinting that maybe the Queen of Blood could use her powers on him. Grugach says, If I had my powers again, if I could be what I was before, I could uh, serve you better. I could do more. Eventually, after some prodding, Grugach admits he also wishes for these powers so he can get his revenge on Hellboy. The Queen of Blood tells Grugach, Ah, revenge, I know. My witches by their art are seeking to find him. Your followers are scattered far and wide searching for him. It will not be long before he is found. When the time is right, I will make you strong again as you did for me. I will do for you, and then Hellboy will be yours. Back over to Hellboy and Alice. They are still with these three birds turned humans, and they are standing outside a castle with a moat of fire. The birds tell Hellboy, For 500 years, our lady's castle has been under siege by demons. Hellboy notices a large knight guarding the bridge on the way to the castle. He asks, Who's that guy? That guy on the bridge is a demon named Eligos. He is a demon and a duke and a knight of the Order of the Fly. 
and he has guarded this bridge for 500 years. Hellboy asks the birds, Well, obviously you guys can uh, fly in and out of that place, and however you got us here, I'm sure you could have gotten us over him and into the castle, right? The birds explain to Hellboy, Our lady requires that you cross the bridge. Hellboy a little frustrated and asks, Your lady just needs some buddy to take that guy out. Did she set this whole thing up from the beginning? Well, whatever. Hellboy's gonna go deal with this Eligos guy. Hellboy, he leaves Alice behind and then he goes on the bridge to confront this demon knight. They tussle a bit, but Eligos is very tough and he easily manhandles Hellboy, knocking him back. The demon knight says, by this road, none shall leave, and none shall enter. None shall pass this way. Eligos grabs Hellboy and tosses him high into the sky, and way back down further on the bridge. As Hellboy is recuperating, one of the lesser demons in the moat of fire talks to Hellboy. The lesser demon makes Hellboy promise that Hellboy will remember him once he comes into his kingdom. Hellboy to this says, um, sure. The lesser demon then explains, I don't dare say his name, but he is a duke in hell and a knight commanding 31 legions of spirits. His authority is granted to him by the kings and princes of hell, and the sign of that authority is the ring he wears on his right hand, the Order of the Fly. To destroy that ring would be to cut him off from his power. Hellboy, with this new information, marches back over to Eligos. Eligos swings at Hellboy. Hellboy grabs the hammer that Eligos was holding, and then Hellboy manages to smash the ring on Eligos's finger. Eligos, realizing what is happening, says, What did you do? Shortly after, Hellboy makes quick work of this demon knight, and Eligos even begs for mercy. Once Eligos is defeated, Hellboy goes back and grabs Alice and finally enters the castle. Inside the castle, an old man gives Alice a cup of medicine. The man tells Hellboy, she'll live. And then finally, the lady of the castle arrives. Her name is Morgan Le Fay, and she greets Hellboy by saying, Hellboy, welcome home. Morgan Le Fay in Arthurian legend was King Arthur's half-sister and the mother of his bastard son, Mordred. We will learn more about her connection to Hellboy in future issues. Back over to the Queen of Blood in England assembling her army. The Queen of Blood greets an ambassador from Jutland. The ambassador tells the Queen of Blood that his king will fight at her side. And then, as a gift, the man presents the queen a crown. The Queen of Blood tells the creature, I am honored to receive so pleasant a message and so beautiful a gift. Bring it closer that I may see it better. The man, he comes closer, but the Queen of Blood says, Closer, closer. You made this? The man holding the crown answers, I did, your majesty. The queen tells the man, Look at me. You know who I am. The man all of a sudden starts tearing in his eyes, and he says, I, I do? The Queen of Blood continues, Good! Now take this crown and break it to its pieces, or better yet, hammer it into a knife to murder your king, and then cut out his heart and cast it into your furnace so the fire burns red, and then take your tools and make me a helmet, make it of iron in the shape of three ravens joined together and carve into it three names, Bataba, Maka, and Morrigorian. So now all will know me, not Queen of Witches, but Goddess of War. The Wild Hunt, Chapter 6 of 8 Hellboy, Alice Monaghan, and Morgan Le Fay sit at a table and talk. Morgan asks Hellboy if he knows who she is. Hellboy, he vaguely knows her story. He says, it's been a while, but I uh, remember the story. Uh, you're the half-sister of King Arthur. Morgan continues and says, and mother of his only son, Mordred. Alice adds, 
Mordred tried to steal his father's kingdom. Morgan responds, Arthur and Mordred met at the Battle of Camlin, where they killed each other. It's commonly believed that the Pendragon line ended there, but it's not true. Mordred had three bastard sons, by a witch named Catherine of Gilfatch. A few of Arthur's knights who survived Camlin knew this, tracked the boys down, and put them to death. But there was also a daughter, and they did not find her, and she grew up in hiding, and eventually she had a daughter of her own, and that daughter had a daughter, and that daughter had a daughter, and so on and so on. So King Arthur's lineage was not lost, and the royal bloodline continued, hidden behind other names, eventually leading all the way to a woman named Sarah Hughes, who was Hellboy's human mother. Sarah Hughes married the demon Azeel in the year 1574. Sarah did try to repent on her deathbed, which is something that we saw in the Chained Coffin short story. Sarah Hughes' other human children were killed, also in that story, and Hellboy is the only one that remains. And due to this lineage, Hellboy remains as the heir to King Arthur's throne, thereby also making Hellboy the rightful king of Britain. Alice Monaghan touches Hellboy's shoulder and tells him, Holy crap! Morgan Le Fay, seeing Hellboy's reaction, says, You don't believe me? Come, I'll show you. Morgan then leads Hellboy through a door, and then they enter a hilly meadow. And in the center of that meadow is a small pool of water. And inside that pool of water lies a sword in a stone. This would be the famous Excalibur sword from Arthurian legend. Morgan tells Hellboy, You feel it. Draw out the sword and your army will come. You died and live again, so the noble dead of Britain will come again to follow their king. The elves who once would have fought this war are gone now, or turned to the Queen of Blood's side. It will be settled on distant fields, and men will never know of it unless you fail. Then all will live her nightmare of blood, till none live at all. Hellboy, he asks who the Queen of Blood really is. Morgan Le Fay then explains that the Queen of Blood's name is Nimue. Sometimes she is called Vivian. She charmed the wizard Merlin and stole his secrets, used them against him, and entombed him alive. She gained great powers to hear and understand the voices of all things in the earth and spirits in the air, but one voice she heard louder than others. The dragon, the Ogdru Jahad, the soul-destroying black dragon from the beginning of the world. It drove her mad, and the other witches turned against her and killed her, and she was cut to pieces, and those pieces scattered, but they would not stay separated. So finally her parts were put into a box and buried in a secret place. But now she's free, and whole again, and still mad. She calls herself a goddess of war now, but her war has no object other than the spilling of blood. All blood. Nothing but blood. She then tells Hellboy that, with the sword Excalibur though, his army will come and save his people. Hellboy questions Morgan, What do you care what happens to the world anymore? What's in it for you? Morgan Le Fay, who is now clearly just a dead corpse this entire time. She shares why she cares about the world. She says, My son Mordred should have been king. You will be. The Wild Hunt Chapter 7 of 8 Hellboy walks through the castle, thinking about everything he has learned. He enters Alice's room. Inside her room, he sees Alice lying in bed, and Vasilisa is standing over her. Hellboy is just imagining Vasilisa there. Vasilisa warns Hellboy to be careful. Alice talks with Hellboy. She asks if Morgan showed Hellboy the sword Excalibur. Is that what she was trying to show him? 
Hellboy answers, yeah. Alice questions, well, why didn't you take it? Hellboy answers, I don't know. For one thing, it was stuck in a big floating rock. Alice says Hellboy could have easily taken it out of the rock. She then questions, there's something else, something he's been thinking about since he came to her house, something bad. Hellboy then has visions of himself beating those giants earlier. Hellboy remembering this, remembers how he sort of in that moment gave himself over to his demonic side. He didn't need to fight those giants. He was invisible at the time, but yet he did. Hellboy says nothing though to Alice's question. Alice then tells Hellboy about the dream she just had. In her dream, she was standing in a room of noble knights, just waiting, and in the center of that room was King Arthur. And King Arthur told Alice that her life was bound to his sword, and that she would be the first to see the new king with his crown. Alice then tells Hellboy, and that's you. That thing that Mab said about you being sent to destroy the world? Even if it's true, this will fix that. You'll take that sword and an army will come and everything will be all right. Hellboy, he thinks on what Alice has said. And then he hears howling outside. Hellboy, he goes to check out the source of that noise. As Hellboy heads outside, his demonic uncle Astaroth appears before Hellboy and tells Hellboy that that howling is the sound of the wild hunt. The hounds are howling for blood. They smell the war that's coming. Astaroth asks Hellboy, you know who rides at the head of the wild hunt? Some say it's Odin or Hearn or old headless King Vold. Hellboy, he cuts in and says, some say it's the devil. Astaroth to this says, Satan? No, Satan, he sleeps for almost 2,000 years now in his pit under his great city, Pandemonium. One day, you'll go there. Hellboy cuts in and says, I doubt it. Astaroth continues, you will. You'll go down into that hole and you'll find him and kill him while he sleeps. And then you'll go up into the city and throw down all of his princes and generals and claim that crown that waits for you there. Hellboy, he cuts in and says, no. Astaroth continues, you will. Astaroth continues, and he says that one day Hellboy will take up his father's sword and lead the army of Hell, and he will break down the walls of Hell and create a paradise for them on Earth. Hellboy, he still denies this destiny that keeps being repeated to him. Hellboy then imagines a shadow of himself standing before him, and the shadow is wearing the crown of Hell, and it is holding the sword of Hell. This shadow of Hellboy is the version of Hellboy that embraces this dark destiny. Hellboy and his shadow self begin fighting. Astaroth tells Hellboy that Morgan Le Fay is right. Hellboy must take Arthur's sword Excalibur. It is the only way to prevent Nimue's holocaust of blood. He must do it, take the sword, save the world, and the rest will play out as it will in its own time. Astaroth questions, why fight it? What's gained by refusing to accept your place in the scheme of things? What's lost? Who do you think you're fighting? It's only you. While all of this is being said by Astaroth, Hellboy is continuing to fight his shadow. His shadow is growing enormous in size and eventually beats Hellboy. And suddenly a fire shoots out of Hellboy and in an instant, Astaroth and the shadow are gone. And the fire then disappears and Hellboy is standing in front of the smoldering castle. The Wild Hunt, Chapter 8 of 8 Hellboy walks through the smoking castle. He is looking for Alice, and he eventually finds her in her room, and she is just a smoking corpse lying in her bed. Hellboy remembers Alice asking him, why didn't he take the sword? Vasilisa then appears and asks Hellboy, It's a good question, so why didn't you take it? Hellboy answers, and Morgan Le Fay, she's a witch or worse. If half of what the old stories say about her is true, she seduced King Arthur, her own brother tried to murder him, and raised her son to kill him and steal his kingdom. She wants me to get that sword, and that means there's gotta be something in it for her. 
Hellboy then tells Vasilisa about the giants that he confronted earlier, he says. On the way to Alice's, I ran into a bunch of giants. I could have walked right past them, but I picked a fight. And I got slapped around pretty good till I got mad. And then I grabbed a piece of a broken sword and I went nuts. And I cut them all to pieces and, and I loved it. What the hell does that say about me? If swinging that crappy busted chunk of metal I had back then made me lose control like that? What the hell would happen if I had Excalibur? Vasilisa says that Alice believes the sword would save Hellboy. And why can't Hellboy believe what Alice believed? Forget armies in saving the world. She knew you. She believed the sword would save you. And she believed you were worth saving. Hellboy slowly starts approaching Excalibur once again. And many characters from Hellboy's past look on as he does this. Mab comments about Dagda and how he would have liked to have been here to see this. Astroth. Sir Edward Grey, Malhomi, Baba Yaga, and Koku. They all look on as Hellboy grabs the sword and he pulls it from the stone. As soon as Hellboy pulls the sword out of the stone, he is all of a sudden transported back to the real world, no longer inside Morgan Le Fay's castle. And also, Alice is standing beside him, no longer a charred skeleton, alive and well. And apparently, she remembers nothing of their trip to Morgan Le Fay's castle. Hellboy and Alice hug. Hellboy is pleased that Alice is alive and well again. And back in Morgan Le Fay's castle, she sits at a table. And she has various playing pieces on that table. Two skeleton armies facing each other. The skeletons on one side of the table white. The ones on the other side black and there's a red figure in the center. Morgan says aloud to herself, Now we'll see. And the Queen of Blood, somehow responding to her, says, What are you playing at, Morgan? You think that sword will make a difference? Let him raise his army. Let him come against me if he dares. He'll find swords sharper and keener to drink blood. Only my army's not come yet. Soon, soon. But not yet. We see the Queen of Blood walking with Grugach. She is still waiting for her army to finish assembling. Grugach, he asks once again if he can be restored back to his former glory. He says, Now is the time. Change me. Make me strong again to, to serve you. Let me kill him for you now. Just give me back my power. The Queen of Blood just shoots Grugach back a stern, kind of mean look. Grugach, seeing this expression, then says, Oh, you can't. You don't have the power to do it. This enrages the Queen of Blood. She shouts back, What? What? Grugach, realizing he screwed up, says, No, please, forgive me. I didn't mean it. But the Queen of Blood responds, Serve me? Better a hedgehog to serve me. A hundred times better, faithless pig. The Queen of Blood then rejects Grugach and throws him out of her camp, hitting him back. Grugach, he eventually leaves out on his own, tears coming down from his eyes and snout. Back to Hellboy and Alice. Hellboy is explaining all about how he got this Excalibur sword, and how he is supposed to use it to raise the noble dead of Britain. Alice hearing this replies, I don't like the sound of that, and how do you even go about doing that? Hellboy answers, uh, No idea. Alice questions, And uh, now you're the king of Britain? Well, I didn't see that coming. Elsewhere, over at the Osiris Club. The various Osiris Club members are standing around a crystal ball, watching Hellboy and preparing for this upcoming war. Some of the Osiris Club members grow nervous, and they figure they need to do some drastic actions. One of them starts calling the Prime Minister, saying he must be warned. But then all of a sudden, seven of the Osiris Club members that apparently were the founding members start murdering the others in their group. So the originals are killing all of the newer members, and some of these newer members have been there for decades, 20, 25 years. But no matter, they were not the originals. 
Eventually, all of the Osiris members are dead, except for the original seven. The original seven members of the Osiris Club explain that they were there in the club's founding in 1866, when the spirit known as Larzad appeared before them, blessed them, and told them that they would live to see the last days of man, and that they should watch for the coming of a king. He would refuse his crown, but his soldiers would know him, and in the end, he would lead them into the last battle, and there he would be killed. And then the seven members of the Osiris Club shall be there to cut off his right hand and use it to elevate themselves over all that remains, over beasts, for in the end, the world will be overrun with monsters. They seven were there in the beginning, so they seven should be there in the end, for that battle and that king are upon us. Elsewhere, in the mountains somewhere, the sound of hammers are heard in a cave. The king of Jutland is dead, stabbed by a jeweled knife. A short man hammers at a mighty forge. He is the man that met the Queen of Blood earlier, and now he is following her orders. He has took the crown that he originally presented to the Queen of Blood. He has broken it down into pieces, hammered it into a knife, and murdered his king. And now he has forged what the Queen of Blood asked him to. A helmet in the form of three ravens. And with this, we end the Wild Hunt storyline. And everything is now set up for the epic battle in the next storyline, which is called The Storm and the Fury. All right, so that was the Wild Hunt, and I think we have really set some stuff up for an epic confrontation to go down in the next story arc. In this one, though, I did like a Hellboy hanging out with the Osiris Club and then uh, them going on this hunt. And then, of course, the Osiris Club turns on Hellboy. And uh, But in the end, Hellboy has to go fight these giants, and I thought there was some interesting exploration of Hellboy. Um, even though he could have avoided fighting the giants, he sort of gave in to some of his demonic side, and he just wanted to fight them. So, uh, interesting exploration there. Um, then we had Hellboy hanging out with this Alice Monaghan character, and then eventually they uh, travel to this Morgan Le Fay's castle, which was pretty badass how it had a moat of fire and there was some demons guarding it, so that was cool. Uh, Hellboy fighting the demon on the bridge was... Uh, pretty cool. And then it was interesting when uh, Hellboy was finally talking to Morgan Le Fay, and then we get some big revelations of Hellboy's uh, origin, and how he is actually a descendant of King Arthur and the rightful heir to the throne of Britain. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of, a, kind of a, a twist in the story maybe we weren't expecting, but uh, I dig it. I think it's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, that was fun. And then uh, on the other side of things, we have uh, Grugach with this Queen of Blood, and we're really building the Queen of Blood up to be a, a pretty badass villain. And I thought she had some cool moments in here too, where she was killing or, you know, just hurting some of the other witches and establishing her power. And um, yeah, and at the end of this story arc, I think things are in a really interesting position to see where things are going to go from here. So yeah, this was a good time. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. And really excited for the storm and the fury. So I will see you in the future for that.